the other person could have, let's say, a red mark or a scratch. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's David Colmeyer. Welcome to the Problem Solver Show. Today, it's 11 o'clock on Tuesday. We are live. We are here basically talking today about recovery and addiction. I am, again, welcome you guys here. Again, I'm Dave Colmeyer, the Problem Solver. Uh, and if you have a problem, any problem that's small or big, I can help you out. Um, I'm a retired police officer looking to help people in general, work with several different law firms, trying to basically get certain people that need an attorney to the right attorney. If you have other problems, I have other different nonprofits and other liaisons that are willing to help people. So again, I'm Dave Colmeyer, The Problem Solver. Thank you for joining the weekly podcast show. Today, I'm here with two lovely people. I'm here with David J. Thank you for coming, David J. Yeah, and um, we have Rita J. as well, basically. I thank you for coming as well. And uh, today, we're going to be talking about addiction and recovery. Mm -hmm. um, since both of you are on the show, sometimes a lot of times I have one person today since it's two people. I wanted to have uh, kind of jump right into it because uh, probably a lot of great information that you guys will share. And I really appreciate you guys coming today because this is kind of a tough topic, addiction and recovery. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to jump into it. So again, um, again, David and Rita, thank you for joining. I know you came from San Diego, so mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you know you coming to this lovely Las Vegas town. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the tables. <laughs> so, so question for you. So Rita, tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and... Um, Let's start with that. Where yeah. are you from originally? Yeah. So I'll just start by saying um, thank you, you know, for having us here. And thank you to my husband who I met in recovery. And my sobriety date is June 1st, 2005. And I'm originally from, grew up in Los Angeles, Los Angeles area and spent a lot of time in uh, Long Beach as well. And uh, now I'm from Carlsbad, California, which is in San Diego. And I got sober in a lovely little town called Corona, California, which is part of Riverside County. And that's where David and I met. Awesome. It's amazing. So um, tell me a little bit. Um, well, let's just jump into you, Dave. Just tell us where you're from originally as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my name's David J. And my uh, sobriety date is uh, April 1st, 2007. Okay. And so the uh, I grew up in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, California. Okay. And uh, I pretty much spent all, all of my time there. Um, the junior high, high school, college. Then I went off to the Army and I came back. And then I lived in Redondo Beach, Palos Verdes area. Okay. And then I, I moved to the Inland Empire, Corona, where all the wheels of my car fell off. And uh, I met the lovely Rita, as we discussed. And now, uh, through the, the grace of the, the 12 steps and the things that we've done, we've built a beautiful life in Carlsbad, California, for the last seven years. Awesome. First yes. of all, I mean, these areas you mentioned are beautiful areas in California. Uh, I just know very expensive to live in. And so I'm thinking Corona is much more reasonable, <laughs> so especially with this housing situation, right? Yeah, Corona is yeah. like the, I don't know, Henderson. Okay. Of, uh, it's uh, like a bedroom community where people can't afford the beach. They got to go east. Yeah, no, I, 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 we, we mentioned before the show that I've driven through the area. I mean, um, I always laugh because when I drive through Corona, I'm out, like I'm confused. Like, is it the desert? Is it uh -huh. Los Angeles? Like, where am I? You know, originally from We're still city. trying to figure yeah, that out ourselves. Yeah, that's what we said, too. Yeah, where were we? Because when we reflect on it, on our sobriety and our recovery, and when we moved to Carlsbad in San Diego, we were like, amazed at how many meetings there were in North County as opposed to getting sober in Corona, California. There was one meeting place, just one in Corona, in Corona. And there was a 7 a.m. meeting. There was a noon meeting. There was a 530 meeting and there was an eight o'clock meeting. And, you know, mon Sunday to Sunday, like all the time. That's it. But that was it. That was the one place where you got sober. And then we got to Carlsbad and it was like, oh, there's 300 meeting places here. You really? know, so it was very, very, I guess w I was fortunate. I'd like to say I was fortunate to get sober in Corona because that's where the foundational steps, okay. you know, were were just cemented. So, so it helped you more being in Corona. Yeah. I got it. You know, in Corona's kind of a little, I mean, how was the drive? Was it like 20 minutes away? Was it close by compared to like being in uh, what Carlsbad was it? or? To get to a meeting? Yeah, to get to a meeting. Oh gosh, 10 minutes. Okay, so it wasn't that bad. Yeah. I just remember being on the 15, I think just 
The 91. No, we didn't. The 91 is the one that's the beast. It's called the Corona Crawl. Corona Crawl. Yeah. Yeah. Off the 91, right? So, okay, so let's just go back to read it to you. So you lived predominantly, you said, where in? Grew up in Los Angeles. Los Angeles I kind of was all over the place, <clears throat> a product of a divorce. Right. And uh, when my parents divorced around 15, I was 15, and my mother took me from uh, our, our home in Southgate, which is part of Los Angeles, and we moved to Long Beach. Okay. So when, so we're talking about addiction recovery. And again, I think, I mean, you know, when we met, you know, uh, even though David and I spoke before through uh, an acquaintance that we have, um, when you guys met here today, you guys were okay with you know using your name and when you're you know recovery. And I, I commend you for even just being out there in general because right now with the problems of the show, we have about um, up to twelve thousand views basically on Facebook or YouTube and different things in general. So you know it's getting out there. We've been there. We've been doing this now. I think it's the thirteenth episode, and uh, every single week we do trying to help people solve problems. So I appreciate you guys coming on. We've had some like community outreach groups that have come on about like uh, being sober or putting them putting people like in sober, uh, sober homes, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But we never really spoke about the addiction and recovery aspect. So like, I thought it was kind of an interesting topic today. And it's not everybody would want to come on, you know, like live, a live show to talk about it that will be out there. Tell me a little bit. I know that you've been recovered since June 1st, 2005, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me like about your past, if you don't mind, like give me a little bit of a dialogue because we all have opportunity to do drugs or addictions. I grew up in New York City. I've had some friends that have tried some things and done things. and. Mm-hmm. I think I actually, you know, probably some people have even overdosed over the years that I've known. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a problem all over the United States. People think that just, oh, just Vegas, right? That, that's a problem. You know? Wait, there's drugs here? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the problem is that you can have an addiction anywhere. It doesn't matter where that's you are, correct. right? So, people think, oh, Las Vegas, it's in city. I mean, fine, maybe there's a little bit more opportunity here over the years. But right now, right, like even gambling, um, you can go anywhere pretty much mm-hmm. to uh, one of these Indian reservations. Uh, how much have you followed it? But even the Palms Casino is being purchased by uh, one of the Indian re- tribes, the Indian reservations buying the Palms Casino and even Virgin. I think that the, the gaming is Indian reservation. But but Indian reservation is going on for a long time. You know, like they have the mm-hmm. casinos and gaming. So if you want to gamble, you can gamble anywhere in the United States these days, especially with the apps oh, of technology, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And then drugs and alcohol is all over the, as well. So just if you want to just give us a little bit of a backstory of what, if you don't mind sharing what you were addicted to or how it started. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, So I was first exposed to weed. Like, pot was the first thing that I ever tried. And I was 13 years old. And I remember not being comfortable having that first, you know, hit of marijuana. I didn't like it. Didn't like how I felt. I didn't like the way that it made me feel. But somewhere around 15 or 16, like I said, when my parents were uh, going through their, you know, emotional, emotional um, divorce and their emotional stuff, just their, their stuff, uh, my mom thought it best to go ahead and leave my father. And then that's when, you know, on f- reflection, I'll look back and say, yeah, that's when I started drinking, you know, right around 15 or 16 is when I picked up my first uh, alcoholic beverage. And one of my um, biggest memories is being on the five freeway on Hollywood, in Hollywood, going to Florentine Gardens to go to a party that my parents had no idea that I was even out in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I drank an entire bottle of Presidente brandy. And I remember the feeling that I had after that, that experience and how free I felt and how uninhibited I felt in really the the risk um the risks that i was taking you know after you know drinking that much you know booze Mm -hmm. um i was like halfway hanging out of the car on the five freeway you know from the passenger's window just you know screaming and just like just feeling so alive and normally, you Sounds know, like a good thing. <laughs> yeah. normally that, that I went, happens uh, every five minutes here in Las Vegas. <laughs> in this trip, like, at, at first, yeah, it's right. a good thing at first. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. See, so there's really nothing wrong with me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so totally I fit right. I right. fit right in. All right. Thank, thank the sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> so, so moving on, you know, that's the way that I always drank. I passed okay. out. I blacked out after that. And I mean, I, a quick question. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you did marijuana when you were 13 that you didn't yeah. drink prior to marijuana. Yeah, I did. Because where I came from, I mean, I think that alcohol was more accessible, accessible. being a 13-year-old, you know, <laughs> like in my home, you know, like my parents having a little bit of a cabinet and they would have yeah. alcohol when people would come over. But the alcohol was more available than marijuana, at least for yeah. me in New York City and I was a little bit in the suburb city. 
But yeah. anyway, so basically, 15, 16, alcohol, drinking, a little bit of parties. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Teenager. Yeah, teenager stuff. And um, I just realized, too, that when we moved and we moved to Long Beach, you know, my mom was busy thinking about, you know, um, a newly divorced woman. And she'd been married for almost 26, 27 years and really hadn't... Um, you know, found out who she was. So there we are in this little uh, one studio apartment and, you know, and she's out doing her thing, going to work and planning things with her girlfriends and I'm going unsupervised basically. So during that time, um, you know, I lived right across the street from my high school and I never went to school. I barely made it to school. You know, I was, um, what area was this in? Uh, Long Beach, like right off of Atlantic Boulevard. Um, you know, you know that area, By like right? The, close yeah. to the water? Uh, what was it? Like maybe 20, 30 minutes away? Got it. Yeah. The beach was close, but not as not as close to... I'm not as close... Wasn't as close to the beach as where we live now. We're, we're really, really lucky where we live okay. right now. So, uh, just in and out of parties, you know, by that time. But the one thing that was always sticking with me throughout my drinking was the risk factor that I would take mm-hmm. and the carelessness of my own person. Okay. You know, um, I lost a lot of my own self-worth, my integrity. Um, I didn't know uh, words like grace and dignity even existed. Um, mm-hmm. Blackout was an everyday thing for me. And then my drinking progressed to the mornings um, and I started to do things that I never thought that I would do. Mm-hmm. I would make promises to myself that I couldn't keep. Um, and then it became a point where I couldn't live with alcohol anymore and I couldn't live without it anymore. This is like age 15, 16. This is already moving like beyond that. You know, like I'm already in like, I'm talking like maybe my 30s already. Like okay, I've had 30s, this, okay. I've had this history of just drinking this way. How you know? long have you been drinking? I mean, you've been drinking since 16 to 30. So probably, th- I think it was 36. You so know, for 20 years you were drinking like more heavily. Oh gosh, I was drinking like I, I, I was a blackout drinker. For 20 years. Every time I picked up, I, I can't tell you if I. But so 20 ever drank comfortably, you know. I Wait, were you drinking like once a week or? I no, uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I probably took one day off. So six days a week. Drinking. Yeah. Got it. And you blacked out. After six I days blacked a week? out every time, Got you it. know. Wow. And it was a lot of, where's my purse? Where are my keys? Where the next morning, you know, okay. where I would have to physically go inspect my car sometimes because okay. of the night before thinking. I may have hit somebody. Did you have any health issues? Because 20 years of drinking, of drinking <laughs> I mean, I drink, my, my worst um, thing is Coca-Cola, you know, and I can, <laughs> you're drinking one now. Butt. Yeah, and I'm drinking one now. I can lose 30 pounds if I stop it, but it is, it is somewhat of an addiction. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I always say to people, like, I enjoy the taste of Coke with ice. Yeah. And, Me uh, too. That's how I felt about Grey Goose. So everyone's different, but it really is somewhat of an addiction, which is a which is a problem. But I yeah. enjoy the taste, but but I don't drink alcohol. I don't really do dr- I don't do drugs. Um, so to me, it's like the one thing I don't smoke. I've always been, you know, yeah. kind of a good kid in some regards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what the problem is? This is what I'll share with you too. Is like my father used to have a lot of soda, you know, uh, downstairs, like in the basement when we would be parties. Mm-hmm. So it was always available. And actually, you guys are making me think right now that in my house right now. I always laugh that I have uh, like a little bit of a bar with alcohol, but we don't really drink. But when people come over, they have a drink, it's available. But I always laugh because we always like, I don't know if it's an American thing, I guess it's all over the world. Like we showcase the yeah. alcohol, right? Yeah. Like it's like, wow, like, yeah. like it's almost like a god, right? Like look, at the, <laughs> look at all the alcohol, we have a look great goose for this, right? And we display it, and I was thinking about it. And I was thinking right. about it, like, you know, when I have three young kids in general, like, what does that show that if I'm displaying it, mm-hmm. you know, my children see it, you know, and how many mm-hmm. people really come over for a drink? I mean, the, tr- the funny thing about it is the house is kind of built. It's a little bit older from 2003. Mm-hmm. So it's like a built-out bar. <laughs> you know, like, there's a <laughs> okay. built-out bar with, like, a little sink. Yeah. So oh, yeah. you kind of, like, you kind of just like, put the alcohol there because that's where it kind of mm-hmm. goes, right? Like, what else would I put in this little area? Yeah. yeah so... Yeah. But now that I'm thinking about it, it probably really is not a good situation to have it <laughs> out there like that, you know, because it's available. Like I said, my parents, they always had it in a little cabinet. Yeah. When people would come over, they would take it out. They weren't drinkers either, you know? Yeah. So yeah. for 20 years, so did you have any health issues in regards to, I mean, 20 years of drinking? I mean, if you blacked out, you blacked out. Memory loss for the next day. You weren't really sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the health issues that I experienced started to come maybe within my last five years of drinking. And part of the... 
the disease of alcoholism, part of that disease it tells you that there's nothing wrong, that everything else it's, is somebody normal. else's problem. But uh, it was almost like a little trickery that... Um, I think I've shared this story with you, so this isn't the first time you'll hear it, David. <laughs> and <laughs> if long, it is... How long have you guys married them? Four, 14 years? 14 years, okay. And there's, always, there's, no, there's always something there's always something good about having a new story when you're married <laughs> <laughs> over 10 years. Oh, we've been married 11 years, sorry. sorry 11 years? 11 years, yeah. Yeah, what's the 14 years then? Uh, it's, it's, how, it's how long I've been it's with you, practically. Together? Yeah. We've known each other? It's been going other. so well, he added a few years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm married 10. <laughs> but it feels like 15. It's so good, right? <laughs> so, like, right towards the end of my drinking, like, the last five years or so, you know, um, hangovers started to become a problem. Mm -hmm. But when I had a hangover, the cure was to drink more. The dog of the hair, however that thing, the, is that the thing? The hair of the dog. The hair of the you. dog, yeah, the hair of the dog bit you. But the one um, ailment that I did have was... Uh, UTIs, urinary tract infections, okay? And when you have urinary tract infection, especially as a woman, it's a familiar, a familiar thing to a woman, you drink cranberry juice. So my solution was to drink cranberry juice with, yeah, with vodka. And I thought this will cure, this will cure. Did it help? It Was it cranberry or the alcohol? It, good somehow it helped. I mean, of course it helped. Right. It helped soothe my alcoholic cravings. You know, and that's something that because I know the cranberry <laughs> juice supposed to help the UTI. I I don't think it did at that really? time because at that time there was the alcohol, a right? yeah yeah interesting and I was very I was a very ill woman Got you it. know very inflamed too Got like it. a lot of infl inflammation so twenty so basically I was gonna say you look twenty five but you said you were thirty six when you stopped do you want to know my age now how old are you now I'm fifty three. You still look good for 53. Right. Well, yeah, she does. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think you were 53. Yeah, 53. I'm getting old, too. So. <laughs> so, he just called yeah, me old. Yeah. Now, me, I'm 25, <laughs> but this is what drinking will get you, right? The, the way I look. So, okay, so we, so we get the gist of it in general. Um, where, I, I guess, let's just jump into Dave as well to talk about the beginning situation as well. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got started. So, we, at this point in time, we know with Rita, basically, how it started from when she was a young child, um, growing up, just kind of, uh, you know, over 20 years, basically, it just became a thing, became normal. And luckily, I mean, health-wise, I mean, you didn't, you, you didn't really get, in, did you ever get into a car accident? Do you uh, remember? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember? <laughs> you did? I did, but nothing that. Nothing serious. Okay. So, nothing serious. So fortunately, yeah. like, did you ever get arrested for DUI? Not for a DUI, but I got arrested in my sobriety. Um, but much older, not, not when you were young. I was my, I would think I was sober nine months and I got arrested, but it was due to a domestic violence okay. uh, issue. So it's amazing, like for over 20 years that you yeah. were drinking, you blacked out, you oh, basically yeah. never got arrested in oh, general. Yeah. So um, the question really comes down to, I would say, is if you were arrested years back, would that have prevented it? Or maybe you would have went to some type of uh, sober classes or AA back in the day. Yeah. That maybe that would have prevented the situation. But you seem fortunate. That, well, yeah. I don't know if it's fortunate, but for 20 years, basically, you never had like really law enforcement. You know, no law enforcement. Yeah, no law enforcement. <coughs> but I mean, there were the just other perils of being a woman and, you know, being a blackout drinker, you know, and yeah. having, giving away your responsibility, basically, you know, like once the I ingested alcohol, yeah, that I, I am now entrusted to your care, that you're just going to take care of me. And, you know, so with okay. that, I'll defer back to, to David, <laughs> what you were asking him. All right. So Dave, so back to you. Tell me a little bit like from when you were a child um, up to like, um, we'll talk about that when you got into the, um, like whether it's A and so on um, after like the break, but let's just talk about right now about you, how you started. Yeah, so my, my, my uh, situation is similar to Rita's, right? I'm a product of divorce, but yeah, I've done, yeah, so I'm a product of divorce when I was 13. Um, I go to live with my dad, and I, I moved from living with my mom. Uh, how much long, how much time we got? We gotta stop? No. No, keep going. Okay. Yeah, I had to, uh, <clears throat> went to live with my dad in Santa Barbara, and this was in the late, late 80, I'm sorry, late 70s, 1978. I'm, I'm a eighth grader mm -hmm. in junior high, and th that's the time of the era and the town where everybody was doing cocaine. Mm -hmm. Everybody. I mean, we're talking nurses, doctors, pilots, cops. It was just like, it, it, it's like, it was the modern day Starbucks. It's like, well, what do you mean you don't do co cocaine? Everybody. So, of course, yeah, that went away, but I just kept the party going. How old were you when you started cocaine? 15. Okay. Yeah. Probably 15. I think 15 when, when, when I first partake of that you know and the thing about it is i just wanted to say i know you invited me to come on and talk about sobriety and recovery but it was very important for me to bring rita on because you know 
uh, for, for, from just some guy talking to about women. I mean, t- talking. I just I didn't know that would be response with women for your female listeners. I want to hear her story. But so anyhow, I, yeah, it's great. I, I feel like I feel like we're kind of rushed. So I don't know. No, we're not rushed. We're not rushed. Right. Okay. Plenty of time. So I. Um, yeah, and it just got, it just got got progressively worse. I um, quick question: so did, other, did you have other friends at fifteen that were doing cocaine? Yes, got it. And do you feel like it was the area that you were in, or like because for me, I don't know, maybe at sixteen, seventeen, I knew one or two people that basically tried it, but like you know, you sometimes you have different groups, but did, like a lot of people were using. Well, it? I yeah. I don't think you're in your 50s. I think you're in your early... 40, I just turned 45. Yeah, right? So, totally a different era. Okay. okay. Right. And we had different dissemination. So I, like I should be doing crack cocaine instead of... The <laughs> well, yeah. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. How'd from, you miss I'm, that? I'm from New York City. So that's, where, I did it, that's where it started. Yeah. So... Um, no, at different times, I get it. And this is, this is yeah, different. yeah. The, the, tr- the truth was is that w- what I didn't realize till long... Yeah, so I mean, I started... I, I could I could spend all the time. See me, I actually know law enforcement. Okay, I'm, I'm very very different. I mean, I um, I, I had I, I've got a lot of violence that goes with me. And you know, the thing about it is, I was able to you know productively accumulate things and and make accomplishments in in the physical and the business world. And then I I would start doing those types of things. And then I uh, I, I I would just make these just ridiculous choices and that involved incarceration right and 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 fighting cops and all those stupid 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 things at, at age 15 no no older, no older. yeah older older i mean if so you 15 want... you started cocaine were you drinking as well absolutely yeah, drinking cocaine any other drugs of choice weed weed so marijuana cocaine 15 how many what age span were you doing this yeah i um it, it's funny because during high school during wrestling when i'm doing wrestling I, I wouldn't do anything because you know you couldn't like do, do, do drugs and be on the team. Did drug test you? No, it's just, but everybody would know. They, okay. You get ratted out, right? And, and, and I had a sense of belonging. And the truth about my, when, I, when I go back in retrospect, the reason I would introduce any type of chemical to my body is because there was a, a, a lack of self-esteem and there was a lack of, of belonging based on an emotional issue, mm-hmm. right? And so I didn't have it. But then what ended up happening is, is that when those things would end, drugs and trouble would follow after all those kinds of things, right? And so, you know, I, I scratched through the Army, I scratched through college, and then I, I, uh, I scratched through a whole bunch of marriages. So kind of pretty much I went to a party when I was 13, and I came home when I was 43, right? And that's when I got sober. I was 43 in 2007. So you were 43 in 2007, okay. And so how old are you now? Uh, he's 23. <laughs> I'm still 43. I'll be 57 next month. 57 next month. Um, how long were you in the Army for? Three years. Did you... Um, did you ever do drugs while you were in the army? No drugs, but lots of alcohol. They drug tested. It was more okay. Lots of alcohol. So you stayed away from the alcohol. Was and, 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 it, and, and it really it caused it caused the same kind of problems. I mean, I really should have been thrown into a detox or a rehab, but they, they weren't that aware back then. And they had more programs like today. Like, yeah. You know, like more people would report yeah. you or something like yeah. that. Did anything happen? So the age of 15 to 43, while this took place, how many times would you say you got arrested due to addiction? Well, so arrested, like, as in cuffs, detained, and put somewhere? Yeah. You Easily went, yeah. 25. 25 times. Yeah. I, in the back of, back of the car for three hours, let go. I mean, that's, you know. That's, when you let go, you, like, you got a ticket or just let go? Yeah, you never knew. You never knew. You know. But how many times did you say you actually literally went to jail? Oh, I'm real clear on this. So in 1985, uh, yeah, for, for, for cocaine, I went, I went for 80 days. I was supposed to go for eight years. Okay. There was just a merciful judge who also was a sober alcoholic. I didn't know that at the time. Wait, so let's go back. Mm-hmm. How many times were you physically handcuffed and actually went to jail? 20. 20 times. Yeah. And then prison time, like you did more than 30 days. Once. You know what I'm saying? One Once. time. One time. For 80 days. Yeah, Santa Barbara County Jail. Yeah. In possession of cocaine. No, selling it. For selling it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so from the age of 15 to 43, started addiction. Now, you guys both mentioned divorce, right? I mean, like that you were, what would we say? Uh, product, product. Product of, of divorce. divorce. Oh, broken homes. Yeah. Broken yeah. Home. Do you truly believe, I mean, like I know a lot of other people that are, you know, in homes that were... I hate the word saying broken. I mean, it's sad to say, but I guess, you know, separated homes. Do you believe that's what changes it? Like, do you think that, you know, because, look, I mean, people fight and argue. I mean, no one's in the look, perfect I, relationship. I, I, look, I was going to, I was going to drink and drug no matter what, because yeah. basically it's clear to me that I have a, a gene in my body, which, which uh, involves uh, a propensity toward alcohol and drugs when you introduce them. And my grandfather died of alcoholism. So it's, it's a genetic thing. Okay. So genetic, yeah. I can get that. But when people say, a product of basically being like a divorced, separated home or something like that. 
do you feel that that was for you, Verita, or do you think Yeah, well, I agree with David that the that there it is that there's a gene and there's a lineage, you know, within my family as well. You okay. know that some people. Uh, I'd, I'd like so to say that hereditary. it stopped. It stopped with me, you okay. know, because I went into Alcoholics Anonymous and started to you know work a program, but I do believe for me that there was an emotional pain that I definitely was drinking away. Okay. Because at that age of 15, you know, you're not fully emotionally developed. Mm-hmm. And, mm. you know, to know your life being one way for so long, even the the bad of it, you know, mm. you don't even know that it's bad. And that, that's kind of like what my first marriage was like. I, I just didn't know how intolerable it really was because... You've been doing it that long. I've just been doing it that long okay. and no, no other way. So I drank to hide the pain. So, and where would you say being in a relationship or from the past or... All of it. Just whatever, whatever was going on, yeah. right? Um, and it's, I think David brought it up. He said not having... Did you say not having the emotional maturity or you were drinking because you did felt like you didn't fit in yeah, or, you yeah, know, whatever? Yeah, yeah, it was just a chronic lack of self-esteem. Yes. That, right? And so, yeah. and a lot of those things as far as getting arrested were based on dares, right? You know, being, being, being that guy. Hey, he's crazy, right? I, He'll do I, it. I... I Right. It's a day to do something. Yeah. And, and it really didn't serve me well. If you don't mind us sharing, um, you said you've been arrested 20 times. You want to go down like the list of things just that'd be interesting? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, 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 okay, so I got arrested twice in high school for, uh, for bookmaking. Um, like, uh, like betting and gambling? Yeah, I was the bookie. I was the you book. bookie. Yeah, I sure was. And no, you don't beat people up because that's how cops come. You know that. You just. But some guy started crying. Oh, Dave, I owe David James sixteen hundred dollars. I can't go to school, and that's how it starts. Um, then <laughs> there, there was possession of weeds. You have to remember, my parents like they were they were school teachers. And there were a lot of rock stars in Santa Barbara, and they were all friends. And so there was just a copious amount of weed, and I sold it at school. So I got probably uh, arrested, taken to juvenile hall, probably yeah, four, five times, right? And then uh, that was like junior high school or high school, high school. Yeah. Were you worried at all when you were selling? Do you remember back then? You just, do you feel more invincible at the time? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't care. I didn't care. I mean, it's kind of like when you got nothing to live for, right? And everything to die for. Yeah. I mean, I'm not in the literal sense, but like in the literal sense, right? Yeah. Um, so then, then uh, later on, my my drinking got involved with, uh, you know, just being some, some kind of rowdy jerk, right, in an establishment, then the cops are come. Cops come to the house, cops will come whatever. And so, anyhow, like, you know, uh, I was taken away for an argument with the neighbors that turned into a fight with the police, okay. right? So, you know, add about five, six of those, right? And then... Um, so fights, book, how'd you get involved in the book? Uh, it's kind of interesting because it seems like a usual <laughs> like high school thing. Like, Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I've got a New York City uh, connection myself. Right? My, my, my dad so, was born there. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> and so basically I was just taught very on by, by an uncle. If you want to be on the better side, be the book. <laughs> and it was just like I, I remember trying to place a bet. You know, early in junior high school with this guy, and I just realized I could just do this myself. <laughs> I it's interesting because I mean, I feel like it's kind of young <laughs> high school. I mean, I think, yeah. I, knew, I think in college, after in college, I knew somebody that was doing that mm-hmm. or something like that, and he owed money to yeah. somebody. But I, 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 I got I killed. I got killed because I would take any action. I got killed on the Ollie Holmes fight in 1980. I got I got crushed, <laughs> four thousand bucks, right? And, and you had to pay it out. Yeah. Well, here's what I did. I, I forged the check. From my parents, right? So it's like the, this is this is part of it. This the reason that's so important that I tell this story because hopefully there there are some listeners, right, who are, are getting into these kinds of jams and they're thinking that it's not the alcohol or the drugs, right? And there was this sign on this uh, AA club in Augusta, Georgia, by the clock. It says, if there's a problem and there are drugs and alcohol involved, the problem is probably the drugs and alcohol involved, right? And so that so when I go back to it. If I was like to remove the chemical intake, I probably would have done only the bookmaking. <laughs> I, I would have only done the bookmaking. I, all those other things, I, I don't. I would have avoided those things because a more rational head would have prevailed. I don't know if this is helping. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, look, this isn't like information where I think that and we'll talk about when recovery about the AA meetings. I think most people like, look, I haven't watched all the millions of videos on YouTube, but I mean, on the most part. You know, a lot of people don't speak about their past or, or we're learning from it. I mean, look, honestly, even if one person watches this and, 
and says, you know what, I have to make a change, and today's my change, I've heard mm -hmm. these stories, and, and we'll talk about the recovery again. Um, you know, if, if we can help one person solve their problem, I mean, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the, this uh, podcast will go to about 12,000, 15,000 views, so you don't know how many people that you want to hear your story and listen, and then this can be a breakthrough for them. Everyone's in a different situation. We all come from different homes. Like I right. said, no home is perfect. I mean, I'm fortunate. My parents have been married for 50 years, and, you know, they're good people, but everyone Mazel argues. Tov. Mazel tov, you know. <laughs> Everyone argues, um, you know, there's no perfect life. People complain, and... Right, they, there's three things that people complain about. What are the three things? Money, sex, and how are we going to raise the kids? I never was how to raise the kids, but I guess that's what it is. I always say money, sex, and kids, but it probably is how to raise the kids. You're probably right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are the three things. And then life, you know, there's different um, challenges that come along the way, and then sometimes alcohol or Coca-Cola or whatever it may be <laughs> or gambling, you know. Um, yeah helps ease uh, the stress or the anxiety or the pain or whatever you're going through and it's an enjoyment no matter what it is. Some people have that through gambling, some people have alcohol. It's not an enjoyment. Until it's, it's not. A, it's a, really, it's, 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 it's a distraction. A distraction. But people think it's an enjoyment at the time, right? Correct. Yeah. You're enjoying it at the time and but your, mind, your you. mind is selling you that basically yeah. Yeah. that this is helping me ease the pain mm -hmm. in a way in general. I'll share one quick thing with you. It's interesting. When I was a cop in New York City, uh, I had a partner, basically, he would go home, and a lot of cops would do this, I think, to distress. They would have to go buy a six-pack and go home and drink a six-pack of beer. I was never into beer. I never really liked the taste in general. My, my dad never really bought beer, but it was something that relaxed him in general, but eventually he can get out of hand, right? Six <laughs> beers, 12 beers, 24 beers, right? So yeah. you got to be careful what you relax with in general. <laughs> so you yeah. uh, need to be careful. What we're going to do is we're going to take a, a quick minute break. Uh, we have some of the sponsors that help you know, with this Problem Solver Show. We actually have uh, the sponsor... Uh, of the show for this week is uh, Richard Harris Law Firm, The Defenders, uh, Ticket Busters, and uh, Universal Motor Cars, and also Real Vegas Magazine. So we're going to take a quick minute break, and then when we come back, I want to talk about the recovery of how you guys kind of had a little bit of a breakthrough and then you went into the recovery aspect. You know, we have 30 minutes to talk about it. I don't want you guys to feel rushed in general. This is great information, and uh, you know what I will do probably as well is I'm thinking that we'll share this you know podcast with the different groups of addiction and recovery so people can mm -hmm. basically hear your story. Remember, sometimes you have to hear the story a few times in order to make some type of yeah. change and a breakthrough. So, um, again, uh, Dave and Rita, I really appreciate your Thank time. You. Let's take a quick minute break, and then we'll be right back. Yeah, go pay those bills. There you go. Another day in Nevada, and we're lucky enough to call it home. The world knows us for our entertainment, but the best part about living here is the everyday people of our communities. And when one of us gets injured in an accident, well, I guess you could say it's personal. We fight for the people of Nevada every day. The Richard Harris Law Firm at 444-4444, just in case. I recommend the Defenders because they say what they're going to do and they do what they say. You're the client, they're working for you, the attorney is your attorney. I am very impressed with the relationship the Defenders has with their clients and I hope to continue working with them. It's not just signing people up, getting clients, it's we're going to take care of your problems and they care about people. Neither one of us are giving a hand out to those people so that they could take advantage, but both of us are giving them that massive hand up. From the moment I came into the office, everyone working at the front desk was super nice um, and just made me feel like I was at home. When you call, you know that they're working for you and that they want the best for you. Universal Motor Cars, your one-stop shop for all things auto, service, body repair, collision repair, free towing with repair, all under one roof. State-of-the-art paint equipment and facilities, trained certified technicians, lifetime warranty on paint. Universal Motor Cars accepts all insurance. Over 10 years in business, LVAC members receive 10% off labor. Your one-stop shop for all things auto. Welcome back to The Problem Solver. This is David Kohlmeyer. Welcome back to the Addiction and Recovery episode. I'm here with David and Rita joining on the second uh, second segment of the show where we're going to talk about re recovery since we just spoke about addiction again. Thank you for joining us today. Um, again, uh, you know, Rita and David just wanted to let you know this particular show, you know, is me basically dedicating my time um, as a retired police officer helping people. Um, I was a cop for uh, 17 years. I was NYPD for about three years. I was MTA police in New York City during 9-11. I worked 9-11 as well. Um, after 9-11, September, I came out here in February, went through another police academy. Um, I was a cop in Henderson for 13 years. 
Um, I also went through CIT training, a lot of different um, alcohol recovery training that I went through. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been to some AA meetings as well and mental health uh, classes and training. Whenever there was training as cops, we always try to get the training so we learn. Yeah. But I will say one of my things of Gift of Gab is to talk to people and to, uh, to basically get them uh, the help that they need. And one of the jokes is, which a lot of people don't know why the show is called The Problem Solver, when I was a cop, I would come to, you know, someone would call 911 or 311, and I would come, I'd be David and Rita, and you guys were fighting, what's going on, and there's no crime, <laughs> and there's no marks on you, and stuff like that. So what happens is, I would say, okay, great. You know, there's no crime committed, so other cops would pull up, and they would say, hey, Dave, uh, you know, are you code for, are you good? And I would say, yeah, I'm good. And then a sergeant would pull up, and, and he'd say, what's going on? Like, oh, here we're good, there's no crime, we're code for. So what happens is I would spend more time, you know, trying to resolve your problem. I would say, look, you probably need to go to AA, you need to call United Way 211. And I basically would try to resolve, be the problem solver. So yeah. one of the jokes was the cops were kind of making fun of me. They go, oh, there's Dave Colmeyer being the problem solver, trying to solve, everyone, solve everyone's problem. Now, I enjoy helping people. I enjoy solving because problems. Because you love being a beat cop. You love Yeah, I mean, right. in New York City, that was a tradition. You'd walk around and you would solve problems. It wasn't, mm. you know, they used to say that crime is not a police problem, that it's a community problem in general but I also believe that people have problems like the police officers even though it's not a crime you're still supposed to help and go above and beyond yeah. to basically help people so I enjoyed that aspect it's the New York New Yorker inside of me I um, love that and so the cops would say oh like let, we could all leave Dave's trying to solve everyone's <laughs> problem you know so they would make fun of me and look some cops are different some cops enjoy uh fighting more some cops enjoy talking more <laughs> some cops you know uh, go, like go for coffee and donuts more right so like every cop is a little bit different but here is my big thing is me being I'll say a Jewish cop I was smart I figured if I resolve the problem today I can go get my coffee and my jelly donut a Dunkin Donuts and I don't have to come I don't have to come back to the same house to deal with the same nonsense so if I resolve the problem today I basically don't need to come back tomorrow so I thought I was being smart but most cops were like oh they'll just come back tomorrow you know, they'll come back the next day. And, and, and personally, I wasn't like, in, like some people were like, were truly trying to like, you know, when you become a cop, you're trying to arrest a lot of people. To me, it was like, I'm trying to solve a problem. And mm -hmm. if you know the Jewish word of a mitzvah, basically you're trying to help people and do good deeds. Yeah. So that's the reason why I basically, you know, wanted to be a police officer. But I wanted to share that story because that's how the problem solver came to play. And since I've been retired the last six years, my thing was I can give back mm -hmm. and communicate and then basically go through, you know, social media, YouTube, Facebook, and basically get some messages across yeah. and share. So every week I have a different, like, community leader or um, nice. different person involved in helping solve problems. I mean, believe it or not, the body shop guy, the insurance agent, the <laughs> lawyer, the criminal defense attorney, the personal injury attorney, yeah. all these people solve problems. So I'm sharing, you know, more information and, and getting information out there. So again, Today for Addiction Recovery is great because we never, we, in the last, uh, I think it's the 13 episodes now, we haven't really dug deep, you know, for addiction recovery. So, quick question for you, for both of you. Have any of you guys been in the D.A.R.E. program back in the day? Was there D.A.R.E. back then? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, it, was, it was back there, but I was... Uh, Do you remember going through it? No. No, no. It, yeah, it kind of started in uh, probably <coughs> 85, 86, I think. Okay. Yeah, and I, I was, basically, that rock had fallen off the cliff. I the reason why I asked that, I was a D.A.R.E. officer oh. for about like two or three years. <laughs> and um, long story short, you know, people say, does D.A.R.E. work? It doesn't work. You know, like the senior cop on the beat would be like, ah, D.A.R.E. is nonsense. It doesn't work, right? Yeah. Now, personally, I enjoyed teaching it and being involved in the program. I thought I was doing prevention. And this was here in Henderson. Um, and I actually was involved in creating a program instead of D.A.R.E. It was called uh, Dreams which now in Henderson is called Dream. And it's a different program. It just like, I incorporated like more self-improvement, like Tony Robbins and stuff like that, mm. to help people. Um, and I think there's kind of coming back. Every city is different due to funding. Mm -hmm. But I was going to ask you guys if you think it works or not. I mean, to me, by the way, the age is normally age 10 and 11, I believe, when I taught there. Mm -hmm. So you guys mentioned that you were age 13 and 15. The goal was yeah. to get yeah. to people before. That's, that's yeah. right. And a lot of people would remember their D.A.R.E. officer, the name. Like, oh, it was yeah. D.A.R.E. officer Colmeyer, you know? Mm. So when you would meet people later, you're my D.A.R.E. officer, right? So, I mean, I, mean, I, I think it was good relationship building with, with kids and yeah. the youth. And the goal is to try to prevent that. So, anyway, you guys yeah. didn't go through it. Um, what, any thoughts about <laughs> Obviously. Any thoughts about just the police coming in? Or do you think it should be other people? Like people with other, you know, addiction recovery, people with their recovery should go into the schools? So What's your I, way of prevention? A, yeah. So l l let me speak on that. So I noticed that you were saying, well, some people are pro-DARE, some people are against DARE. And, you know, Rita and I are here on a, on a mission to promote recovery if somebody is afflicted with a chemical intake. Okay. Right? That's what we're about. Now, I speak for Rita on this as well as myself. We found recovery through Alcoholics Anonymous, but we're not here for Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't represent Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. But 
I tried everything, mm -hmm. right? And so the thing about it is, is there are people who will say that Alcoholics Anonymous will work. I'm one of them. There's a who will say it won't. And you and I both know that dare can work if you've got an open mind. And there are those who just won't do the do. So <clears throat> some people get sober at church. You know, they're, 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 there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of places, you know, but, but my opinion. So, yeah, I, I do think... I do think all cops start off, right, because they want to help. I think that's what gets them into it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and I, I actually used to like seeing the cops because, you know, they, they had a sense of, of pride about themselves, and they were put together, and, and there was an envy as a young kid, even though clearly my behavior wasn't going to put me on that side of the line, right? I'm, I'm incredibly pro-law enforcement today because they were protecting the society from people like me because mm -hmm. handcuffs are society's way of saying, hey, David, we don't agree with your behavior. Right. So, but anyhow, now I'm digressing. But yeah, I, I, I think getting the cops in, especially if you're a cop that's going to risk the ridicule and go up against it's, 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 that's tough to go in to the younger people and say, hey, have you considered this other way? You know, the goal, I think, is, is everyone has a different breakthrough, right? I mean, if you, mm -hmm. that's why I said to you for, you know, for 20 years that you had the addiction, had these issues. If you would have been arrested year one, year two, year five, would that have been a breakthrough? Everyone's breakthrough is different. Right. If you would have gotten into an accident you got, and you injured somebody, that they would have went to the hospital. So to me, mm -hmm. it amazes me for 20 years that you basically didn't have a breakthrough, meaning that may law enforcement, that you got handcuffed, that you went to jail, that you know something happened. It's, it's sad to say I'm saying that you're fortunate. You're fortunate yeah. you did that, but maybe you would have been more fortunate if... If there was more of an intervention uh, with police, intervention, right? Intervention, yeah. Yeah, but maybe, you know, it could I, be. But I, intervention could be from family, could yeah. be from friends, right? Yeah, no? I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. I'm going to say, I Talk to I me. went to jail early, right? and it didn't make a difference, right? I'm only speaking from my story, right? But there, there's a guy that I was in AA with, right? Who actually went to prison for five years for manslaughter. He came back into AA and he was now sober, and boy, I sure have seen the light. And he he decided he didn't want to do AA anymore, and now he drinks every day. Okay. Okay. So, for, for me, I was done. I was done. I was so tired spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, health-wise. I just, I said, okay, I'm going to try it your way. I and and everybody, everybody who actually finds that bottom, they they they've got to do it, whatever that is. And so, I, I just personally just I don't. For me, that that didn't and that wouldn't have worked. <coughs> but maybe Rita's got a different. And everyone's, thing. I think, everybody different. I was about to say male, female doesn't make a really a difference in some regards, but you never know. But the thing with it is, I think it's the breakthrough is different for everybody, but maybe if mm -hmm. it's genetic or it's hereditary or basically or hard head, of hard head. head um, basically, mm -hmm. maybe that makes a difference in regards to the recovery aspect. So tell me, Rita, how did you wind up doing the recovery? How did how did you have a breakthrough? Well, the break, the breakthrough for me, um, I didn't get sober immediately. Like when once I realized, okay, there's a problem. I started to realize that I had a problem with drugs and alcohol when I was 26. And even then, I was kind of questioning it and um, reached out to a family member that I knew had quit drinking. But uh, that conversation didn't really, it wasn't really helpful. Um, so I just kept drinking, you know. And then I remember getting pregnant with my first child, with my daughter, and, um, you know, having a nine-month reprieve. You know, I didn't want to drink. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling people back then that I wasn't going to drink anymore. And at that point when I said I wasn't going to drink anymore people were saying like oh yes you are of course you are so there was an expectation that I continue to drink and my bottom finally occurred you know um, unfortunately with my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old um, I was going to take them it was a minimum day and I was going to take them to see Bruce Almighty and I was already two sheets to the wind at about 7 a.m. in the morning and I winded up blacking out like I always do. Mm -hmm. And I blacked out and passed out on the steps. And that was where we finally, and I finally realized that this was getting beyond just casually drinking. And that, that weekend uh, was my first weekend in entry into um, the AA program. What made you go to AA? Because are there other programs that are out there that are basically are helping, or AA is just kind of known for so many years? I. Uh, because back in the day before uh, AA was completely anonymous, um, there used to be a commercial on television. And I think you and I have talked about it, but if you remember it, where there were candles burning. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't see the people's faces, but you just saw the candle burning. And that was, that was the only thing I knew about um, 
a, re- a way of recovering is AA. was AA, nothing else. But that that one commercial had an impact on me, you know, years later. So it was a commercial that you saw on TV? Years ago. And that's one of the things that I think about, you know, it's a little unfortunate because there's a tradition in AA that says that we don't discuss this, you know, um, from press, radio, and films. And it's it's kind of like if we can help somebody, then why aren't we speaking, you know, up about it in press, radio, and films? And, you know, it's a, it's a topic of controversy, you know. Um, so I don't know if we're breaking tradition here or not. <laughs> How long did you go to AA for? To I still go. So you always go, right? Yeah, you yeah. always go. You never stop. I don't go to... Uh, it's well, like go, like going that. to the gym for your mind and okay. your soul. Yeah. So you've been going for how many years? Uh, it'll be 16, June 1st. So 16 years. And then you're going once a week? I go, I go, I started going, uh, I used to go, gosh, uh, at three times a day when I was first getting sober. Like the first three years of my recovery, I was in AA meetings three times a day. Okay. And then um, now I probably do two meetings a week. Two meetings a week. And I'm of service, which is important. So do you feel like program. if you miss a meeting, like you could go back? Uh, not anymore, you know, in the beginning, definitely. But for 16 years, I mean, you must, it must feel like a home, like, like it just, mm, it's yeah. like necessary to do. Yeah, definitely. But it's if you like, feel like if you stop going at all? I, I, there have been times where I have felt like I want to stop going, but I don't, you know, and I you defi- know it's helpful. Yeah, because I, I definitely have other avenues that help my spiritual right. program. So the bottom line is it helps maintain you and maintain your course of recovery. Right. Because, rec- I mean, it's funny you mentioned before when we put your names up, recovery or recovered. I guess would you always consider you, you're always recovering, right? Uh, yeah, continuously. Yeah, technically, we're still recovering, but we've recovered from the from hopeless state got it, that got we it. were in. That's a good point. Right. Yeah. So the bottom line is that you recovered from like the major crises that you guys yeah. went through. Now you're just kind of maintaining it. Daily it's like, maintenance. It's like a daily or weekly maintenance to mm-hmm. basically maintain your lifestyle and basically being uh, addiction free. Yeah, yeah. If I could speak on that, that what for me, I had to realize there, there's not a uh, chemical solution to my spiritual problem, right? And so basically, and it says very clearly in the book, which is our doctrine, that we actually never recover, we're never cured. We get a reprieve, a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And so I'm only speaking for me, but continuing to do the AA meetings, right? Continuing to do what's called 12-step work, which we're doing right here, Mm -hmm. right? Is to actually, uh, it's like like going to the gym when you're a fighter. You might not have a prize fight, but you understand that that's your form of conditioning. And that's, that's the best way I can explain it to a layperson. How many people read it are in normally the meetings when you go? How many people are there? Um, it depends. Between Sometimes two there's... and 1,500, right? What's well, the most amount of people Zoom. Yeah, Yeah, because we've no, been in Zoom meetings. Pacific Group's got 1,500. Uh, eight, 800 uh, is one of the biggest meetings that I attend. It's a Wednesday night um, 800? meeting. 800? Yeah, there's 800, but it's on Zoom. And How many people in person? Probably 300. That's the biggest meeting that That's I've attended. Meeting. Yeah. But in Corona, where we got sober, probably about 50, 50, 50 to yeah. 60. Maybe you got to pass on my problems, I'll record. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there the, are a lot of problems in those rooms. <laughs> I mean, everyone's got problems every single day. We'll try not you know, get through them best, the best that we can. Dave, tell me how you recovered. Yeah. How'd um, you get to, you went to AA yeah, as well? It, so it, AA is basically, yeah. is what's really out there to help people. Well. It's been out there for a long time. <laughs> It just so, uh, for my story, and I want I want to ma- maintain that I say that You're Alcoholics not. Anonymous isn't the only way. There, yeah. there, there's Celebrate Recovery. There's many of other places. But for me, everybody around me was suggesting strongly, you need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I first went, <laughs> the very first meeting I went to, I was in another very, uh, I was in a, I was in a different marriage, and it was very unhealthy. <clears throat> And I remember I went. She said, well, how'd it go? I said, well, they, they got a six-month waiting list. So they said, which was a lie, mm-hmm. right? They, they don't have a waiting list. But I actually was going, and I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything, taking any directions. And, of course, one of the directions were you got to either stop drinking, right? So for, I was doing that 10 years before I got to sobriety. So, I, so basically, I've just, I've just come over 14 years, and it's taken me 24 years to get 14 years. So... I mean, just the real, the real issue, if you want to get into the solution, is, is that I, I stopped listening to myself, and I started listening to these people that really showed me nothing but love mm-hmm. and tolerance, lots of tolerance for me, because I was, I was a totally different man than I am today. 
And I, I started just working that program. And I, and I started, and then when I was in early sobriety, when I was still spiritually vulnerable to possibly taking another drink, and I'm just going to say that for me, that hole is plugged today. I mean, it's a one day at a time program. I never lose sight of that. But I started like getting involved and they got a saying in order to keep it, you have to give it away. Mm -hmm. So that's why we came all the way from San Diego, right, to sit here and share this because maybe there's give one, it away. well, there's one person out away. there who's thinking, you know, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired and I'm going to, I'm going to find AA in Las Vegas. You can, you can call the phone. If you were to call central office, Alcoholics Anonymous and say, I don't have a ride. Can someone get to, let's take the zoom and COVID out of it. Okay. Right. Back because meetings are going to come back. There's somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous that's got a commitment to pick people up and bring them to meetings. So if you want it, you just need to pick up the phone and be willing. And, and just, if you've you got to ask for help and listen to the direction. So that's not the question you asked me. How did I get sober? <laughs> I just, I was in so much pain. And I almost, almost when you were talking to me about how you try to help those problems, man, it moved me. I'm so moved by what you're doing here. I appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, I'm getting a little bit clamped in the podcast. Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah, so... Uh, I'm going to have to charge you extra. <laughs> well, thank God today... I'm not going to buy more tissues. Yeah, <laughs> ran out of tissues. <laughs> thank God today I can afford it, right? Because I don't spend that money in booze. But anyhow, I, I just I just stopped listening to me. That's good. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so the bottom line is, is that you were able to do a breakthrough. You went to yeah. the meetings. The both of you are proof that AA meetings do help, do work. Well, the AA For, program... Yeah, the, the meetings themselves they're not going to work for you. You have to go. You have to. You have to do, you have find to do the work. Sponsor and yeah, have you them have take to do through. the work. So if they do the work, get a sponsor, go to the program. Yeah. Even though there's other programs, but the truth yes. is, there's success for both of you going through the programs. But you guys technically did, did the work, right? Yeah. That, that's the only one that worked for me. And that we continue to do on a daily basis. Real quickly, how are your mentors? How do they assign a mentor? Like you show, if I show up today, how do they assign you? How, how are you assigned a wife? Um. <laughs> It was online eHarmony. No, 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 but, but you understand I paid what I'm saying. And uh, they sent me this beautiful Persian. But, but you, but you understand. Well, what I'm saying to you is it's like it's. <laughs> there you go. Oh, My bad. So, See, I'm still making trouble, even with 14 years sober. I, um, the first step it, is admitting you have a problem. It's, <laughs> it, it's just. I, got, I admit I got plenty of problems. No, but it's just you find somebody who has something that you want. And ironically, the pe people I liked in the beginning were the people I actually hated after I got sober and vice versa. The people I hated are the people that were trying to save my life. It, 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 it's a natural indoctrination. But the truth of the matter is if you go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, I, and I'm speaking about alcohol in any form because really what I didn't talk about was because I don't want to waste the time. I want to get the solution. My problem was, was Vicodin. Right? My problem was Oxycontin. My problem, I, I had all those pharmaceutical pills because doctors were giving them to me. Right? So alcohol in any form, what if you're putting something in your body, if you're willing to take the direction from the people who actually walked before you and did this from their experience, not their opinion, then that, that's how it happens. And surely, surely there will be a man, in my case, men for men, women for women, right? a man who actually will just, they'll have their hand out and the light will shine the right way. It's, it's an organic thing. So, um, the bottom line is AA helps people. You have to do the work. Sponsors help. Maybe it's not the right sponsor. Maybe it's a different sponsor if you don't like the person. Yeah. Or, or as, you're, <laughs> as you're changing with yourself, maybe you're finding someone more suitable. You know, yeah. in the beginning, maybe it's, yeah. it's hard for the truth in general, right? Yeah, I wear it like a loose garment, you know? The bottom line is, you guys, I think anything in life that I've learned, I've been to a lot of self improvement training seminars and like listen to Tony Robbins and different people. I think anything in life, you need to take some type of action, whether mm -hmm. someone else pushes you there. But the first step is basically, right, admitting that you have a problem, going mm -hmm. to an AA meeting or going to go anywhere that's a nonprofit that's looking to help people in general. Now, out here in Las Vegas, and I'm sure it exists in California, there's mm -hmm. something you call United Way, which is 211. Basically, it's a, let's say, call them 311 non emergency, or mm -hmm. police is 911 211 United Way, which is referral, uh, referral services that every day they update the system. And a lot of people don't even know about it. I've been I've been talking about two one probably for maybe sixteen or fifteen years. But if you ask mm -hmm. people what's two one one, that everyone's clueless. They don't do enough marketing with it, and mm -hmm. it's basically a referral resources uh, for the city. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we have it on the screen. That it says two one one. Mm -hmm. Basically, what it says is it says um, if you have any type of problem, emergency resources, or um, if you, any type, it connects you with whoever's you know actually helping people. Yeah. So my question to you is, what do you recommend people? Um, besides two on one, where else would you tell people? Because like I said, we're going to take this podcast, we're going to put it into the different groups of addiction and recovery. Mm -hmm. What messages, you know, we have about six, seven minutes left. Mm -hmm. what, who, what do you want to tell the listeners and viewers 
of who to call or what to do. Also, if you want to give your number um, out, if you want people to call you, if they want to talk with you because they may feel a rapport dealing with you guys, if you want to do that as well, or give them a number that you want them to call. I mean, I'm just throwing things out there. Mm-hmm. At this point in time, you know, the last six, seven minutes of the, of the podcast and the video show, I want you to be able to share whatever you want to share so that other people can get the help. And this is the way that you're paying it forward and helping people with intervention and, and a breakthrough. So, mm-hmm. uh, Rita, do you want to share with, with both of you guys? Yeah, just uh, if you think you may have a problem with drugs and alcohol, you know, one of the things that worked for me first was to try not drinking alcohol. Not drinking alcohol. To be able to admit to myself that I even had a problem or maybe there was an existing issue. But like I said, I knew when I was 26 there was something off about the way that I drank. So uh, looking up in your local, uh, your local area, there's probably a local chapter of AA or, um, as David has said, you know, there's a Celebrate Recovery out where we're from. It's called Celebrate Recovery from your church, a church. Um, you know, you can get in touch with somebody there, you know, and just, you know, reaching out is the very first step. You know, it's probably the scariest and hardest step to admit because you're not sure what your life is going to be like without drugs and alcohol. <coughs> But I do speak for both of us that we're proof that we do have a life beyond our wildest dreams at this point in our recovery because we have gone through some serious stuff, especially in the last two years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But we're fortunate enough because we have a foundation, like a set of rules and traditions that keep us accountable and... That's all I have to say about that. And I appreciate you sharing so much you know, in depth inside about, you, you know, both of you guys in general. What would you like to share? Yeah, so uh, here's, here, here's what I'd say. The first thing is, is I don't know if somebody's like doing their, their ironing while they're listening to this or whatever it is, but you have to be willing to say, you have to humble yourself enough to say, I've got a problem, right? Because it's a, it's a disease based on shame. And most alcoholics, most drug addicts, they're not bad people who need to get good. They're sick people who need to get well. So I'm just going to say that. But if you're that type of person, you can call any pastor in any church. And if you say to him, hey, this is what I need. Can you help need me? Help, yeah. right. or, or, or everybody who, who comes to AA, you need to do one, one of two things. You need to go to detox immediately, right? Because sometimes people, if they stop drinking. Detox their, first, right? Some, sometimes, depends on how much you've been drinking, right? You need to go to detox. got to be willing to go to detox or Salvation Army or whatever it is. Or you need to actually throw, turn yourself into AA and say, I can't do it, and they will guide you by the hour. But if you really want it bad enough, and you're here in Las Vegas, you Google Alcoholics Anonymous Central Office Las Vegas. They've got people around the clock, because okay, they got the office that's Monday through Friday, but they got someone who picks up the phone who can tell you how to get home immediately. Mm-hmm. All right? And so th- th- that's the thing. Now, is, if somebody wants to reach out to me, and I'm just going to say, you have to be male if you want to reach out to me. If you're female, don't call me. And we, we just, there's this unwritten rule, men with men, women with women, for, for just the obvious reasons. I haven't heard that, but I can understand why. Yeah, <laughs> right. So basically, so if you're a man in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you actually can call me at 831-222-5444. Five, four. Four five. Four five. So it's eight three one two 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 five four four five. I'll put that on the podcast as and, well. And if you want to get a hold of Rita, you're a female yeah. you have a man call me. Okay. Okay. And I will actually get the number and I'll have Rita call you back. But okay. I just I just it's, no, I hear it just you. what happens is all of a sudden I don't have hit that private number. Uh, all, all of a sudden <laughs> Does that work if you go for a massage, it's man and man or woman and woman? No, I had man, <laughs> I, I don't care. <laughs> I know my dad's I, like, he's like, I, I need a woman to massage you, not a man. <laughs> Rita needs a woman too. I need a woman to massage I, I don't. I don't care. You're next. Let's go. <laughs> so again, I appreciate it. I'm going to share your name and number out there. If anyone wants to basically talk to David or also be passed over to Rita as well to yes. talk about if, you know, maybe you, you feel there's a bond and a connection. And Questions. Like I said, I mean, up to 12,000 people, you know, people who have issues or problems, they want to talk. You know, the one thing I'll share with you, me as the problem solver, again, I don't charge any money for basic this actually costs me money in general to basically do this program um i will share with you i have no problem you know any listeners I, if you call me um at my number uh which is 702-400-7474 if you call me i'd be more than happy to help anybody that has any type of addiction problem refer them to the right source i'll nice. drive anybody over to any of the AA places or any i have connections with um sober homies um 
uh, Nova Mu. There's different programs, counseling, therapy, you know. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has a problem with addiction um, and they want some type of recovery, uh, reach out to myself, Dave Kohlmeyer, the problem solver, um, at 702 400 7474. Also, we have the progressive web app, which is the problem solver.vegas. Uh, you can click, I'll actually add drug, um, uh, well, add addiction, you know, as a tab, and you basically want to click on it, name and number, be more than happy to call you, connect you guys. What I can do to LBC help in general on the screen shows the quick app, but we'll add, um, there's resources and information on the progressive web app, but I will add a tab for AA meetings or a nice. recovery and addiction help. But if I need, if, if, you, if you're about to get in a car and you basically think that you're intoxicated, uh, I've said this before over the numerous years, I have no problem sending Uber or Lyft to your location and driving you home or driving to an AA meeting out of my own pocket, I'd be more than happy to do that to pay it forward because I want to prevent you know people getting arrested and accidents. And as a retired cop, this is what I basically want to do is help people prevent crime from taking place because you know that person driving under the influence could be could hit my wife, you know, and my children in my car. So again, thank you both David and Rita for joining the problem solver and hopefully I'll have you guys back on the show in the near future. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time and sharing the insight um, and your personal life here on the show, which is incredible for people to listen. And I believe that they'll take that message and they'll make some change today. And again, I urge all the listeners, if you have a problem, this is the time. This is Or the know time. someone who has a problem. Or know someone who has a problem. Let's get them some help. Let's make some change today. And again, thank you so much for joining the Problem Solver today. Thank Thanks, thank David, thank for having you. us. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks for your work. Meet Joe. Joe's a very busy guy. He's always driving from work to meet friends. And sometimes Joe's in a hurry and doesn't follow all the rules. Joe just got a traffic ticket. Traffic tickets are a major hassle. You have to take time off work to go to court and stand in long lines. A couple days later, Joe saw his friend Matt. Joe tells Matt about his traffic ticket troubles. Another traffic ticket? Just call Ticket Busters. Ticket Busters? What's Ticket Busters? Ticket Busters is the quick and easy traffic ticket solution with licensed attorneys. Ticket Busters went right to work for Joe's ticket. Ticket Busters did all the work saving Joe time and stress. A few weeks later, Joe receives a call from Ticket Busters and his traffic ticket has been resolved with no points, no traffic school, and no insurance increase. Ticket Busters help Joe bust his ticket, and Ticket Busters can help you too. Go to TicketBusters.com, download our app, or call 702-666-6666. Activated.